Heavenly Father, we come before you and we just thank you, Lord, that you've given us uh, wisdom, insight into the things that are happening in this world and what the future holds. And we just pray tonight as we go through Matthew chapter 24 that you uh, speak to our hearts, help us to understand these things, not so we're, that we're fearful, but we understand and we can share with others the things that are coming to pass. Uh, well, Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. And Lord, just uh, again, open it up to our hearts and our lives. And as always, Lord, as we come before you to worship you, we just pray, Lord, that the songs we sing unto you would minister our hearts and just draw us close to you and just honor you, Lord. We thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24 as we continue our study through the Word of God. And as we pick up our study this evening, it's still probably Tuesday of the week of the crucifixion, probably late afternoon by now. Uh, the day was packed, filled with activity from the cleansing of the temple to the questioning and rebuking of the religious leaders to just sitting down in the temple and watching the way people were giving to God. And before Jesus leaves the temple area, we're told in Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39, that Jesus lamented over the city of Jerusalem and for its people. It was because of the destruction that was coming upon them because they rejected him. Listen to what it says in verse 37 of Matthew 23. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the day's ending. It's a long day. Jesus is leaving the temple area. Again, blasting the religious leaders for their hypocrisy. And he's going to head back to Bethany, to the home of Lazarus, Mary, Mary and Martha, friends of Jesus. And he'd have to go through the Kidron Valley uh, and then up and over the Mount of Olives. But as he's traveling, he doesn't get too far before his disciples begin to question him about the things he said. And as we're going to see, Matthew chapters 24 and 25 are known as the Olivet Discourse, as Jesus is going to be sharing with them, you know, just not the destruction of Jerusalem, but what's going to happen in the last days as he returns in glory. He's going to speak about prophecy. Now, I realize that there's a lot of people out there today, a lot of Christians that don't want to deal with prophecy. They're either afraid of it or they just don't care. Here's the thing. Why are we afraid of prophecy? God has given to us what the future holds so we wouldn't be afraid, so we can tell others about what's going to happen. We see these things come into pass before our eyes. We see the leaders of the world wanting to unite the world together in a one world religion or one world government. We see the, the Pope and other religious leaders, even Protestant leaders, wanting to unite the world together in a one world religion. We want to see a monetary system that's global. These are things that God said is going to happen. So it, we shouldn't be taken by surprise by these things. And here's the thing. If the Bible is over one quarter prophetic in nature, why are we eliminating it from our teaching? In fact, how do you get rid of a quarter of the Bible, 25% of the Bible? You can't. You shouldn't. And I realize that when some people you know, hear prophecy, they think of you know, the vague predictions of, the some so-called prophets or fortune tellers, you know, oh, when, you know, the sun rises and, you know, the trees grow tall, this will happen. And it's like, you know, yeah, you can fit anything into there. There's one story that uh, um, this uh, 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 king was told that in battle, he would destroy a great empire. Sounds good, right? So he went into battle. He lost. His empire was destroyed. Either way, that prophecy was going to come to pass, right? <laughs> One way or another, either he was going to be victorious and his empire would rule, or he would be destroyed and his empire would be lost. So many people look at prophecy of the Bible that way, but the Bible is very specific. Yes, yeah, some are very difficult sometimes to understand, but a majority is very clear. But you Bethlehem Ephratah, you know, though you, you're a little among the people here. But out of you is going to come forth one to rule the nations. 
He's, we're told that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem of Ephrata. There were two Bethlehems, one in the north and one in Judah. God was pretty specific where the Messiah was going to be born. In fact, when uh, the wise men came and asked Herod, you know, where, this, where the Messiah was going to be born, Herod went to the Jewish religious leaders. And they said, oh yeah, Bethlehem of Judea, right over there. Just go there. They didn't go to see the Messiah, but they knew what the scripture said, where the Messiah was to be born. In fact, there's over 300 prophecies of Jesus Christ's first coming that were all fulfilled down to the tiniest detail. Over 500 of a second coming. It's pretty good. In Isaiah chapter 44, verses 6 through 8, listen to what we're told. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God, and who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people. And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. So God is challenging people to say, hey, look, tell the future with 100% accuracy. But there is no one who can do what God says. Just me. And he gives us the prophetic word. And the idea here, like I said, is that it dispels any fear in our lives. Because we know what's going to happen. And we're to go and tell others. You are my witnesses. Absolutely. Now we have a lot of ground to cover here in Matthew 24. So we're going to dig in. Matthew 24, starting in verse 1. And let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we study through his word. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. So they're leaving the temple area, and the disciples of Jesus are just saying, Man, isn't this a beautiful temple? Look at how gorgeous this thing is. It was magnificent. You know, Herod, when he beautified the temple that was rebuilt, he did a wonderful job. It took him some 80 years to complete. And it was, it was a sight to see. In fact, uh, Josephus tells us that it, he had 10,000 men working for eight years. Wow. To beautify it. And it was completed around 63 AD, just seven years before it was destroyed by the Romans. And the stones that Herod used, 36 feet long, 12 feet thick, 12 feet wide, 120 tons. I don't know how we moved those things. It's pretty magnificent. In fact, Luke tells us some of his disciples began talking about the beautiful stonework of the temple and the memorial decorations on the walls. So they're, they're looking at all this beauty of the temple, these massive stones, how stable the structure was. And yet, really, it was just an empty tomb, if you think about it. God left that temple long ago. In fact, God was standing right before him. And think about what they're saying. Jesus just said, look, your house is left to you desolate. And they're saying, but yeah, look at our temple. Not one stone's going to be left upon another. Oh, look, this thing is beautiful. It's not going anywhere. Nothing's going to happen. Well, yeah, they were living in a fantasy world. And Jesus is giving them the truth. And how many Christians today, think about this, are, are living in a fantasy world because they're ignoring prophecy? You, know, you hear Christians go, oh yeah, you know, it's, the world's just getting better. I'm not sure where they're living. I don't know what world they're living in. And when you see how Jesus responds to what they said, I think he shocked them by the words he said to them. He said, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. It's not going to last. This temple's going, guys. And just some 37 years from this point, Titus and the Roman army came in, leveled the city, killed over a million Jews. A fiery arrow supposedly shot by a drunken soldier set the temple ablaze, and it melted the precious stones, the gold, the silver, or the precious metals, I should say. To retrieve them, they had to knock down the stones 
And that's what Jesus said, not one stone was left upon another. And you could go to Israel today and see for yourself the accuracy of this prophecy. You would, if you went there, you'd enter through the Dung Gate to get to the Temple Mount. To the left is the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. That's the retaining wall of the temple. And on the right side, they are ex excavating, and you can see some of the stones that were knocked down during this time. That's just as Jesus said. Now, you would think at this point they probably just, the disciples would be quiet now. All right. I guess we got that wrong. The temple's going to be destroyed. But they are going to ask Jesus some questions. And what I want you to see is that this is Jewish territory. This is speaking about the Jews, as we're going to see. Look at verse 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, we call it the Olivet Discourse because this teaching was given on the Mount of Olives. Not a big, you know, deal there. Uh, the teachings he's going to give are dealing with the second coming, uh, the tribulation period. And understand, in their minds, they didn't understand that Jesus was coming back. They didn't see second coming. They, they're thinking kingdom. They think the Messiah is here. They believe Jesus was the Messiah, so now the kingdom is going to be established. But as you're going to see, Jesus is going to explain a little bit more on that. And the three questions are simple. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? What will be the sign of the end of the age? You think, well, why would they ask those questions? Because Jesus just said the temple is going to be destroyed. back, And back in 23, how desolation is going to come upon Jerusalem. In fact, in Luke 19, 11, the, this was the focus of the disciples. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. See, they're waiting for the kingdom to come. They know it. The kingdom is coming, but it wasn't coming in their day. And as we go through Matthew 24, Jesus is going to answer these three questions. Look at verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So the first question Jesus is answering, when will these things be? And I think it covers verses 4 through 26. That's what Jesus is going to answer. This covers the seven years of the tribulation period. The verses we just read cover the first three and a half years, the beginning of sorrows. And Literally, it's the beginning of birth pangs. And think about it, ladies, if you've had children, when labor starts, it's not that intense. You may get a little twinge here, a little twinge there. But as it gets closer to the birth, the pains get more intense. They get more frequent until the birth of the child. Well, that's what's happening here. We've got these labor pains that are happening. They are not happening very close together. They may not be very intense at first. But as you get farther and farther along in the tribulation period, the intensity of the judgments that come are going to be more, and the frequency is going to get closer together. So this is dealing here, like I said, with the first three and a half years, uh, minor pains with uh, false Christ, wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes. This is the start. So the warning, first of all, and this is one we see today, we are living in what I believe, and this is just my opinion, and I could be wrong, but I believe we're living in what I would call Braxton Hicks contraction time, false labor pains, just the prelude to what's coming, the tribulation period. And what the warning Jesus gives, and he uses this word several times about deception, being deceived. And this is related to religious practices, the wars, the famines, the pestilences, and the earthquakes. Does that mean that these things aren't happening? No, they are. But where are these things leading you to? They're leading people away from God, and they're leading them to the Antichrist, the one who's going to save them. Think about religious deception today. 
wow, there is a proliferation of false doctrine coming into the church. And again, I think it's leading us into one world religion. I, I just saw the other day, one of the guys from uh, Harvest was, I don't know where he got the statue of the Pope, but he was praying to the statue of the Pope to help in the Ar Harvest Crusade. I'm like, what is going on? Come on. And no one says anything? And we may just say, well, that, that's just a minor issue. Are you kidding? The Protestant church, they just had a big gathering in Washington, D.C., where the Pope spoke, and it was all about unity. And I'm sorry, I came out of the Roman Catholic Church. I know what the Roman Catholic Church stands for in regards to salvation. I need Jesus, and I have to work my way into heaven. Is that what we see in the scriptures? No. You will never be saved by working your way into heaven. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. So we see the Protestant church merging. In, in uh, 2017, it's the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther putting his thesis on the church door in Germany. And supposedly they're going to gather together, the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, to unite back together. What was separated 500 years ago, we're bringing back together. Is there coming a one world religion? Absolutely there is. Absolutely there is. And it also speaks of false Christ. Now, there's always been false Christ, false messiahs out there, always. But I think this is speaking of more than just these people. It says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. The Greek word for many is polos, and it speaks of a very great number, millions and millions of people, and not just a select few that are calling themselves God, many. And look at what we see today. We see it with, you know, the New Agers, uh, the health, wealth, and prosperity teaching. Lots are falling prey to this, thinking that they're God. I mean, the Lord said in the scriptures, you're going to die like men if that's what you think. You're not God. There's only one. So I, I, I see this as this proliferation of this false idea that we're God's. And what was the big thing with Lucifer? I want to exalt myself above, the, above God. I, he, it was the big I, I will statements. God said no and cast them. Many today feel that they're gods. I feel sorry for them. And I, I think that what Jesus is saying here really fits in with what, he's, what was told in Revelation 6, verses 1 and 2. Now, when I, now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see, and I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Who's the rider on the white horse? It's the Antichrist. It's the ultimate false messiah, right? And he comes on the scene. There's going to be many, but he is the leader. We also see wars all over the place today. Terrorism that will increase. The word will in the Greek, melo, carries with it the idea of continual hearing. So constant talk of actual wars and rumors of wars to agree that has never been known before. And again, you know, we hear a lot of that today. We see that in the second seal. When I open the second seal in verses 3 and 4 of Revelation 6, and I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. And another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. That's speaking of wars. In verse 7 of Matthew 24, we see famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. I was amazed that the number of children who die each year from starvation is 1.5 million. Wow. I mean, it's just mind-boggling when you think of that number. Every 3.6 seconds, someone in the world dies from hunger. Every uh, day, 2,864 people die from hunger. It's just incredible. So if there is major wars, ecological disasters, some drought, yeah. Revelation 6, verses 5 through 6, the third seal. The third living creature said, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. 
And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So we're talking about famine here. It's going to cost a lot to buy food. But who's not going to be touched? The oil and the wine? The rich. They'll have the resources to buy what they need. And a denarius was the daily wage for the working man. So it cost you a day's pay to buy three quarts of barley, which was the lower end. Feed a family of three. A quart of wheat, that's all you could buy. Feed one person a day. So you'd be in trouble. Someone said we're only one crop failure away from global famine. And there are... 14.8 million square miles per year of desert increasing. I couldn't believe that. I, I double-checked it. 40 square miles each day of desert. Doesn't that blow you away? I mean, I thought, no, that can't be right. And it was. Pestilences, yeah, AIDS, Ebola. But what about any other biological warfare? You know, we got all kinds of gases and stuff out there. In fact, from what I understand, Syria has so much sarin gas that it, for the United States to remove it or any country to secure it, they would need 75,000 troops on the ground. I thought, wow, where'd they get it from? Iraq? Yeah, Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Revelation 6, verses 7 and 8. All that's happening. The fourth seal fourth living creature saying come and see so I looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with him and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword with hunger with death and the beasts of the earth so natural disasters yes deadly diseases yes it's going to be a mess during this period of time what I thought you said it's going to be those first three and a half years were going to be pretty good for some people but not for everyone. And, and here in verse 8, he says, these are the beginning of sorrows. What does that mean? It means it's going to get a lot worse. Those are the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. What's going to happen in the last three and a half years? It's going to be bad. Time of Jacob's trouble. Look at verse 9 of Matthew 24. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And, the many, and then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So we open up here with this word in verse 9, then, which speaks of after those first three and a half years take place. Now we're in those last three and a half years. Like I said, time of Jacob's trouble according to Jeremiah 30, verse 7. And we see this persecution grow against the Jewish people. And the hatred for the Jewish people is going to grow and grow. And we, we're starting to see it already. I mean, have you ever, I mean, think about it. We saw what happened with the Holocaust. Did you ever think anti-Semitism would grow so quickly? after what happened to the Jews. It is. In some parts of Europe, Jews are warned, don't wear a yarmulke, don't wear anything that's going to make you look like a Jew because you're going to be targeted. Well, what kind of society are they living in? The hatred is growing, and it's going to get worse. Now, how are these Jews, because it seems like they're getting turned in for their faith, how are they getting saved? Well, remember, during those first three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation period, Moses and Elijah are witnesses for the Lord, and they're killed at the end of three and a half years. Out of their ministry, 144,000 Jewish, Jewish evangelists come forth. They bring the gospel message, and they're going to be persecuted for their faith. We also see not only these 144,000 Jewish evangelists who are witnessing, but we have false prophets as well, as well rising up for what? To deceive people. And we, again, see that today, but it's going to get worse during the tribulation period again. 
Here's the thing. There is no way we as Christians should be deceived. How can I say that? Because we have the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Why should we be deceived? There are people that are very good at what they do. They, they're very good at deception. I, I don't know if any of you have seen the show. It's called The Carbonaro Effect. This guy's a magician. And he can make you believe in something that is totally impossible to happen. Totally impossible. He, he peels a picture of a fish off this card and throws it in water, and the fish is alive. He goes, yeah, they, they kind of dry them out, and then that way they can pack them. And, and these people are like, wow, that is great. That is unbelievable. I've never seen it. I can't believe it. And they believe him. Why? Because he's so good at deceiving. And he's a, he's a really nice guy, and I think that's why people just buy into it. But so are these false prophets. I mean, think about it. Think of some of the things that are being taught today. Why are people buying into this? Because these guys are good at what they do. But we have something better. We have a spirit tester. How do we know what spirit it's from? Look at the Word of God. And to me, it's as simple as that. And if it's not found in the Word of God, guess what? Toss it. Run from it. We're also told lawlessness will abound. You think, man, <laughs> does it get worse? Yeah. This is the tip of the iceberg. And the love of many will grow cold. Think about that. We were talking about that tonight and, you know, how that is so easy to allow to happen in our own lives. When you see all the things that are happening and you get cold towards people. We've got to be careful. We've got to be, you know, sensitive to the things of God because it can happen to us. Now, verse 14, you know, a lot of mission workers like to use this. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So before the Lord can come, we've got a witness to everyone in the world. And the only problem is that's really not what it's saying there. What is it talking about? Well, in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, I think we see the answer. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. Will the gospel be preached throughout the world? Absolutely, but it's going to be done by this angel. Does that mean we should stop missionary work? Absolutely not. We're called to go out and be witnesses throughout the world. But don't use this verse as, you know, the idea that until we go to every corner of the earth, the Lord's not going to come back. That's not what this is saying here. Well, verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on a housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing with babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Now, the abomination of desolation. What is that about? I was just listening to uh, J. Vernon McGee. And he was hilarious because he was talking about his daughter going off to school and she got this bouffant hairdo and didn't recognize her when he went to visit her and thought that was the abomination of desolation. <laughs> it must have been bad, but no, that's not what, you know, what he's, what's being spoken of here. When you look at the book of Daniel, there's a man who was a type of the Antichrist. And I think he did what the Antichrist will do. Uh, out of the divisions of the Grecian Empire, there was a leader by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. He was from Syria, and after he defeated the southern kingdom of Judah, probably around 168 BC, he went into the sanctuary, sanctuary discredit, or, uh, desecrated the temple. He slaughtered a pig on the altar, poured swine broth over the holy vessels. He took away the Mosaic law, the, the observance of the Sabbath, the feast, even the circumcision of their sons. And he set up an image of Zeus in the holy place in the temple. And this was the abomination of desolation. 
So I think the Antichrist is going to do the same thing. You know, he's going to stop the daily sacrifices, as we're told in Daniel. He wants them to worship him as God. And in Revelation 13, we're told that he, he was given power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Is this image set up in the temple of God? Possibly. What is this? I don't know, but whatever it is, it's got the power to kill people, I guess. Pretty scary stuff. So that tells me that the temple is going to be rebuilt. Think about that. How's it going today? There's no temple there. Who's in control of the Temple Mount? The Palestinians. In 1967, Moshe Dayan gave the authority, after they had taken over the city of Jerusalem, the old city, to Jordan. And Jordan has given it over, really, to the Palestinians now to oversee. So there's no way they're going to allow the temple to be built. But you can go on the Internet. You can look at the Temple Institute in Israel. They have the plans for rebuilding the temple. And from what I understand, they already have... The plans are drawn for what the temple is going to look like. They already wired it with uh, video cameras. And I guess you could watch what's going on in the temple from anywhere in the world. Well, that's interesting because it says in verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, how could people from all over the world see that? In fact, only the priest could see it, because, and the high priest was the only one who could enter the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. So how could they see this happen? video cameras, short, you know, uh, the TVs around the world could be putting this forth. So the temple's going to be rebuilt. They've got the temple implements. I've been to Israel. I've seen the menorah that they built. I've seen the priestly robes that they have. I've seen many, the altar of incense, all these things that they already have made. The priests are going to school to learn the sacrificial system. They are ready. In fact, you know, you hear sometimes that they're trying to take the foundation stone up to the temple, which causes a riot by the Palestinians, but they are prepared. And I think it's only God holding things back right now because they are ready to go. They are so excited to get this temple up and running. And Daniel tells us that the Blood sacrifices, the grain sacrifices are going to start up again. But at the end of the three and a half years, the first three and a half years, the Antichrist is going to stop him. And he goes into the temple and demands to be worshipped of God as God. And Jesus says, when you see this happen, get out of Jerusalem. Don't go into your house to get your clothes. You just run for your life. In fact, the word flee in Matthew 24, 16 speaks of a fugitive being on the run. That's exactly what. They're running away from the Antichrist and his forces. And I think they flee to Petra in southern Jordan. And I think God protects them for those three and a half years. You know, it's about 120 miles southeast of Jerusalem. That's a long way to go. In Revelation, it says that as they're fleeing... The Antichrist sends his forces after him, but the ground opens up and swallows them. So God does protect them. Now, in Daniel 11:41, which is speaking about the Antichrist moving out to conquer the land, it says, He, the Antichrist, shall also enter the glorious land Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. So I think... God is protecting them from the Antichrist and protecting those people. Um, in Isaiah 16, verses 1 through 4, Send the lamb to the ruler of the land, from Selah, or Petra, to the wilderness, to the mount of the daughters of Zion. For it shall be as a wandering bird thrown out of the nest. So shall be the daughters of Moab at the fords of Arnon. Take counsel, execute judgment, make your shadow like the night in the middle of the day, Hide the outcast. Do not betray him who escapes. Let my outcast dwell with you, O Moab. Be a shelter to them from the face of the spoiler, for the extortioner is at an end. Devastation ceases. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. 
Petra is a Greek word that means rock. Hebrew, it's Sila, so you'll see Sila used in the Old Testament. Uh, also called Mount Seir or Harry, because that was Esau. That's where the sons of Esau uh, came to live. And Petra is an amazing site. If you've ever seen, you know, um, Indiana Jones and, you know, I think it was uh, The Last Crusade, where they're going through Petra and it opens, you go through these, the, this narrow passageway where just a rider on a horse pretty much can fit through. And then it opens up into this beautiful area and in the mountains, it's just all this carved figures and stuff. It's pretty amazing. Um, I guess it can hold some 1.5 million people. And it's interesting, at the entrance of Petra, carved into the rocks are two huge eagle wings. And in Revelation chapter 12, it says, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. Three and a half years. So this is speaking of the Jews. Now, some people feel that Christians go through the tribulation period. I don't see that. But this has got to be specifically speaking to the Jews because it says, you know, pray that your flight may not be on the Sabbath. Do you have any problem traveling on the Sabbath? No. If you go to Israel today, there's a big problem. There is nothing going on on the Sabbath. When the Sabbath is over, it's party time. I think it's Benny Huda Street you go to, and you have just big, big celebrations, music, dancing. It's just a wonderful time. The Sabbath is over. But during the Sabbath, you can't travel anywhere. So this has got to be speaking of the Jewish people. And again, as you look at Matthew 24 and 25, this is Jewish territory. Jews are asking him a question, and Jesus is answering them. Look at verse 21 of Matthew 24. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were short, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look here, is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. So Jesus is saying, look, there is no other time in human history that anyone can compare this period of time to. And man's heart is so evil, unless he returned, we destroy ourselves. And yeah, we could do that today. When this was written, they couldn't destroy everyone. Today we can, really, with the push of a button. And Jesus says, unless those days were short, no flesh would be saved. Now, it's not, Jesus is not saying it's going to be less than seven years, but it's not going to be one day too long or one day too short. It's going to be exactly as God said, and it's going to be a time of great distress that's never been seen before. And if God didn't shorten those days, if God let them continue on, we wouldn't survive, we would destroy ourselves. But... He's given us the time frame, 1,260 days from the abomination of desolation. Now, this word elect, some say this is only used of the church. And so because of that, the church has to go through the tribulation period. Yes, the elect are used for the church, but not exclusively. Jewish people are also used as the elect. And the bride of Christ is taken to be with the bridegroom. I mean, really think about it. Before you got married, did you put your wife, future wife, through all kinds of hell just to get her ready? Well, you probably did, but that's another story. <laughs> bad, bad comparison. Why would God do that? He's coming back for his bride. In fact, when you look at it, you read Revelation, chapters 2 and 3 deal with the church, the church age. When you get to chapter 4 of Revelation, it says, after these things. After what things? After the things of the church. What happens? John is caught up to heaven. It's a picture of the rapture. And then what happens? Then the seals are open. The judgments come. The church is gone. 
And God is dealing with the nation of Israel once again, and he's dealing with a Christ-rejecting world. Now, again, false prophets, deceivers. He, he's warning them. If they say to you, look, he's in the desert, don't go out. Look, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe it. He's speaking to the Jews, okay? Where are they? They're in Petra. Guys, Jesus has come. Come on out of there. And Jesus says, don't listen to them. Don't go out. Don't listen to these false prophets, these teachers. When he returns, it's not going to be in secret. In fact, as we get to verse 27, it's like lightning flashing across the sky. Everyone will see. You're going to know when he comes back. In 1917, the Jehovah Witnesses said Jesus was coming back. But he didn't. Well... He did, but he came in secret, okay? He's in a secret chamber. He's controlling the world through the watchtower and Jehovah Witnesses. I think something happened with the signal. It doesn't look good right now. I don't think the Lord's on the throne on this earth yet. He's letting us do pretty much what we want. He's given us over to these evil things. But he's also put us here as Christians to be a light in this dark world until he comes back. So don't be deceived. Don't believe it. When Jesus comes back, man, everyone's going to know it. So here in verses 4 through 26 of Matthew 24, Jesus answers this question, when will these things be? When is it going to happen? When is it going to take place? When is the kingdom going to be established? The beginning of sorrows or the beginning of birth pains, the first three and a half years on into the great tribulation, the last three and a half years. And as we look at the second question, what will be the sign of your coming? That's verses 27 through 31. Look at 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. So think about this. It's a pitch black night outside, right? And there's this thunderstorm. And when fl lightning flashes across the sky, what happens? It lights up the sky, doesn't it? I mean, it's so bright. And that's the idea here. When the Lord returns, every eye is going to see. At the end of the tribulation period, when he returns, they're going to see him. Revelation 1.7. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even though they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. So it's not a mistaking of this event. He's going to come in the midst of the darkness. He's going to pierce that darkness with his light. Now, Verse 28 says, For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered. What is that talking about? Well, I think it's talking about his second coming, and when he comes, he's coming in judgment of a Christ-rejecting world. We know that to be true. And in Revelation 19, verses 17 through 21, dealing with the same period of time, the last part of verse 21 of Revelation 19 says, And all the birds were filled with their flesh. In other words, the birds are going to come to this feast and they're going to feast upon the dead bodies that have fallen in battle. Not a pretty picture. We know at the end of the tribulation period, the Antichrist, there's some uh, uh, discord among his people. He's coming back to, to deal with that. And finally, they, the armies of the world gather in the Valley of Megiddo for the Battle of Armageddon. Now, the word for coming in the Greek speaks of the visit of a high-ranking person. And that's what we see here. Almighty God coming back, the second coming. Wow, we long for that day. Now, again, here in verse uh, 31, it talks about the elect, that he's going to gather his elect from the four winds. Huh. What is that? Who's that speaking of? Again, it's speaking of the Jewish people. So, what will be the sign of your coming? Well, as lightning flashes across the sky, man, you're going to see. Every eye is going to see. 
One more question, though. What will be the sign of the end of the age? And that's in verses 32 through 51, dealing it with that last question. Look at verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When it's, its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the very doors. As surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So again, what will be the sign of the end of the age? Talking to his disciples, to the, these Jewish men, not Gentiles. And again, it's important for us to understand that. Context, context, context. And I have to admit, you know, eight or ten years ago when we first went through the Gospel of Matthew, I kind of put Gentiles in there where I thought Gentiles fit. But this is Jewish territory. There is no idea of, of Gentiles at all in this section or in chapter 25 as we're going to see. And this parable of the fig tree, again, has caused a lot of confusion today. Uh, there's two views on it. Um, I think there's only one correct view, but you know that's. I'll show you why I think that way. But because it says fig tree, we say it's got to be Israel because Israel in the Bible is spoken of as a fig tree. And that's absolutely true. But I don't think that's what it's talking about here. In, turn over to Luke chapter 21, dealing with the same uh, teaching, the Olivet Discourse. In Luke 21, we're going to pick up in verse 29. And here's the key. You've got to let the scriptures speak for themselves. And he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and what? All the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves the summer is now near. So you likewise, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. But surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Look at the fig tree and all the trees when they're budding. This is an agricultural reference, not symbolic. If you were to look outside and you start to see trees budding, you know spring and summer is coming, right? You know it's, it's getting near because those are the signs. And that's the point that Jesus is making here. The generation that sees these things happening, these birth pang, pains, will see the second coming of Jesus. Why? Because it's only seven years away. When it starts, it ends seven years later. Now, I thought this was Jewish territory. Well, it, it still is because this word generation Gen Genia in the Greek speaks of a race or, race or nationality. It's speaking of the preservation of this nation of the Jews. And look at how many times they've been tried to be destroyed from the Old Testament until our present day. So, in a sense, it's speaking of the Jewish people not as fig trees, but the generation that sees this will not pass away. In other words, they will not be eliminated, they will not be exterminated. The Lord is going to come back. That means the persecution against the Jews is going to be pretty intense during the tribulation period. Absolutely, they're fleeing for their lives to the rock city of Petra. Well, if that hasn't bothered you yet, verse 36 will get you. <laughs> but of that day and hour, no one knows, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, is this speaking of the rapture of the church because no man knows the day or the hour that it will take place? Well, Absolutely, no man knows the day or the hour that the rapture is going to occur. We know the seasons, and we look at the signs outside, and it looks like it's getting close, but we don't know the day or the hour. But who is spe Jesus speaking to? The Jewish people, not the church. And if this is speaking of the second coming of Jesus and not the rapture, then why does Jesus not say no one knows the day or hour? Well, first of all, when Jesus spoke these words, the tribulation period didn't start. They can't count off the days from the abomination of desolation uh, until the coming of the Lord. And secondly, keep in mind the things that are taking place during the Great Tribulation period. Man, if, when you look at those events, people are not going to be thinking much about that, counting off days. Well, we only have another 364 days or whatever, you know? Now, I think 
as we get to the days of Noah, as we're going to read on here, some say it's speaking of the rapture of the church, but I, I again see this as judgment. The days of Noah was a time of judgment. Um, but some say, wait a minute now. In the Old Testament, don't we see Jesus speak of his first and second coming, sometimes in the same sentence? Yeah, we do. Absolutely, there's no doubt about it. Do we see that in the New Testament? Absolutely not. There's no place in the New Testament. In fact, even in the, in the New Testament, when Jesus begins his ministry, he leaves off the judgment part out of Isaiah. Why? Because it's speaking of a different time. So they're not linked together. And keep in mind, the church was a mystery until Paul revealed it to us in the New Testament. The disciples are not thinking of church. The church, is, it's going to be Jews and Gentiles. This is going to be great. They have no clue. They're thinking of what? Kingdom, right? And Jesus is trying to explain that. This is, again, Jewish territory. Look at verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, also will, be, will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you did not expect him. Now here's the thing. If you think that this is speaking of the rapture, praise God. I mean, this is one of those things that I, I kind of looked at that years ago, felt that way, but again, I see this as purely Jewish territory. Not a, to me, it's not a huge deal. I, I just see this as, as being Jewish. And when Jesus is speaking of the days of Noah, He's not talking about the wickedness that prevailed during the days of Noah. And then the judgment came. Yeah, are, are we going to be immoral like the time, days of Noah? Absolutely. We see it now. That's not the point, though. Jesus says they're going to be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Is there anything wrong with eating? What does it mean? Life is just going on. They're just doing their normal activity. Is it evil? Well, yeah, there's probably a lot of evil going on, but this is just normal life. And think about Noah, 120 years, building the ark, preaching righteousness to the people. They refused to listen. Life went on. And God shut Noah and his family in the ark, and once the rain started, it was too late. Judgment came, and they were taken in the flood, and Noah was saved. And I think this, again, is speaking of judgment. In Luke chapter 17, verses 34 through 37, we're told, I tell you, in the night there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said, Where the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. There is the key. Speaking of judgment. Not the rapture. Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. For what? To partake of them in judgment. So I don't, I don't think this is speaking of the rapture. Again, if you do, that's fine. You know, it's not a big deal. But I think, again, this is Jewish territory. And as we get to Matthew 25, we'll see the separation of the sheep and the goats. The sheep enter into the kingdom age. The goats will not. Judgment. John Wilbur put it like this. He said, There is no scriptural basis for reading the rapture into Matthew 24. The occasion is entirely different. At the rapture, the church composed of those who are saved is taken to heaven. At the second coming of Christ, the saved remain on earth, and the unsaved are taken away in judgment at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. The very word used to describe those taken away in Matthew 24, 40 through 41, is used of Christ being taken away to the cross obviously being taken in judgment as used here. 
the conclusion for those living at the second uh, at the time of the second coming is similar to that of the time of Noah. Therefore keep watch because you do not know what day your Lord will come. Though the passage is talking about the second coming of Christ and not the period preceding the rapture, obviously, if those living in the period before the second coming who were able to see signs of the second coming indicating its approach should be watching, how much more should those waiting for the rapture, which has no signs, live in constant expectation of the imminent return of Jesus for his church. Absolutely. We should be, I mean, Paul was looking for the glorious appearing of his great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his day, here we are 2,000 years later, it's 2,000 years closer. We should be waiting for his return as well. Well, look at verse 45. Who then is faithful and why and why servant? whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if the evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of the, that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, faithful servant and evil servant. And again, I think, you know, again, the focus is the, the Jews during the tribulation period. You see, not all the Jews are going to come to Christ. The nation as a whole will, but not every single Jew. I mean, some will be turning their fellow Jews in because of believing in Jesus. Now, We are also warned that there are those that are evil servants and negate the Lord's return and do what they want. And they're going to take care, they're going to beat those who love the Lord. That means Gentiles as well as Jews, but again, keep in mind this is Jewish territory here. And when the Lord returns, they're going to be judged. How do I know this is speaking of judgment? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay? There's judgment there. They're going to be cast out of the kingdom age. They are not going to enter into the kingdom. This is not speaking of faithful and unfaithful Christians. Not at all. Because again, this is speaking of hell, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I probably challenged a lot of you this evening with some of these things. And, you know, pray about it. Search the scriptures. See what the Lord is showing you. Um, for me, and as we look at next week, again, chapter 20, 25 of Matthew, this is all Jewish territory because the Jewish disciples were asking Jesus about the kingdom. When is all this going to take place? And he's answering those questions as we've seen tonight. You know, what will be the sign of the end of the age? They, they had no clue about the rapture. They had no clue about the second coming. They had no clue about the church. Well, didn't Jesus talk about the, you know, upon this rock I'm going to build my church? Didn't he say that to Peter? Absolutely he did. But do you think they had any clue what the church was about? No, they didn't. They didn't even have a clue about the death and resurrection of Jesus, and he kept telling them, you know, I'm going to go to, to Jerusalem. The, the religious leaders are going to uh, persecute me, and they're going to put me to death. And the third day I'm going to rise. And, you know, they just heard death, and they forgot about rising the third day. So they had no clue about this. In fact, even after his death and resurrection, it's interesting because the focus is still the kingdom. In Acts 1.6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So now is it time. You know, they, they knew what the scripture said, that the Messiah is going to sit on the throne of David and rule and reign for a thousand years. That's what they're looking for. And Jesus is trying to help answer those questions for them. And, you know, being challenged is not necessarily bad um, because it causes us to search the scriptures. I think that's a good thing. Um, these are not new revelations that I have. These are not some, you know, bizarre stuff, I don't think. Um, and there's a lot of good teachers that think this speaks of the rapture. There's a lot of good teachers that don't. Who's right? 
I'm very comfortable in the way I'm teaching it, otherwise I wouldn't teach it that way. Um, if you can show me that this is speaking about Gentiles, or just a couple verses are speaking of Gentiles, why? Why do we have Gentiles inserted into something that is so Jewish? Uh, we don't see that with, with, in the New Testament. We see in the Old Testament things put together, first and second coming, but we don't see stuff like that in the, the New Testament. So I'll leave you with this this evening from Titus, what Paul said, what I shared already. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. You see, we need to be looking for the Lord's return. And people say, oh, you know what? You are so heavenly minded, you are no earthly good. You know what? If you are not heavenly minded, you are not going to be any earthly good. I'm sorry. You've got to keep your eyes focused upon Jesus. You have to be guided by him. You know, in a world of darkness, you know, like I said, you know, the love of many are going to grow cold, right, in these days. And as Christians, we struggle with that as we see all this wickedness around us. Think about those that don't know the Lord, how cold their hearts are getting towards people. We need to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. We need to daily surrender our lives to Him and say, Lord, take all of me. Lord, help me not to become cold and jaded and, and harsh towards people, but help me to be sensitive. Help me to be wise in the days that I'm living in. Wise as serpents, gentle as doves. And you know what? It's just called surrender. And isn't it the hardest thing to do? You know, growing up, I was never a giant. I was always a short kid. Got picked on a lot. But I'll tell you what, I refuse to surrender. And sometimes that applies in our Christian life. I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to surrender. I'm right. I know I'm right. You know what? What does God say? Because he's right. When he's hanging on the cross of Calvary, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Someone cuts me off the road. I don't know if I'm that quick to forgive them. <laughs> <laughs> right? It takes a heart of surrender. And with the Lord coming back, when? A year, five years, ten years, fifty years, a hundred years down the road? I don't know. This I do know, that one way or another, I'm going to be with him. Either he's coming for his bride while I'm living, or this body is going to go back to the dust of the earth, and I'm going to be with him. So that's a win-win. So no matter what anyone does to me in this life, it doesn't matter, because I'm going to be with him. I want to shine for him while I have the opportunity, and I'm sure you do too. And as the world gets darker and darker, you are going to stick out like a sore thumb. People are going to notice you. They're not going to always like what they see, because the light exposes the darkness. But don't let it stop you from shining, but shine in love, the love of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we again come before you. We thank you for your word. And just, Lord, showing us a little bit about the future, the things that are going to be happening, Lord, and just to prepare us so we're not taking our caught off guard and that we could share with others as we see these things coming to pass that your word has already told us these things. There's nothing to be afraid of, but it should spur us on to shine more for you, to speak boldly of you. We love you so much, Lord, and we just pray that if there are any who uh, have been confused by the study tonight, Lord, that you, by your Spirit you just speak to their hearts and, and help them to understand these things. We love you so much, and we just thank you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.